Hello, everyone. Uh, maybe it's good morning for you. Probably it is. Uh, my name is Floor, and I will be your host for this track for the entirety of the day. Um, so Vadin is an established web framework that allows web applications to be developed entirely in Java. Uh, but recently, it also supports a single page application approach, which has become the standard in web day, uh, dev these days. And Simon Martinelli, who's joining us, is the owner of 72 Services LLC and has been working as a software architect, a developer, a consultant, and a trainer for 27 years, uh, especially in the Java enterprise environment. And his current quest is increasing the efficiency of full stack development with Java. Um, well, hence this talk. Uh, so Simon, thank you for joining us. And uh, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I will talk about full stack development with Java because if you're, uh, for example, in a smaller teams, usually um, it's a problem if you have to do both full stack and uh, front end and back end development. And so there are solutions like uh, Vadin and also Hilla, the other framework that I will show you today, that may be a better fit if you are a full stack developer. Uh, some words about me. I'm already uh, working as a software developer for a very long time. And uh, I'm also active in the Java community. So I'm organizing in Java user group in Switzerland. And uh, for Vadin, I'm using Vadin for like four years now. And I received the Vadin Community Award two times in the last two years because I'm very active in that community, also helping other developers uh, to move on uh, with these frameworks. Now, before I dive into the frameworks, let me show you a project that I recently did and where we were using uh, Wadin as a framework. So the project uh, was an ERP migration. You see on the left-hand side uh, the existing uh, screen. That's an Oracle Forms. So Oracle Forms in that case generates some Java UI code and uh, we had to replace that. Now, the problem with the ERP system is that the ERP system uh, is a so-called data-centric application. That means it has a lot of database tables. And in our case, in the project, we even had like uh, a lot of stored procedures. And the goal was to keep the business logic in the database, not to migrate that, but to replace the Oracle Forms um, UI with some modern web framework because uh, the left-hand side uh, picture shows that this is a desktop application, so you have to install it uh, because it's Java, it runs uh, on every machine, but you have to distribute it. And it's also not, not uh, mobile capable, so we had to go another way. Um, here are some numbers about uh, the current system. So it's, not a, it's an ERP product, so the company uh, sells that product to small and medium businesses and it has around 800 forms. Forms means that are screens that the user can enter data and we had around uh, 1,800 tables and uh, the 4,600 procedures and functions contained business logic. What's special with project two is because it's a product, the customers that buy the product need to be able to adapt uh, the UI to their needs or to um, add some additional functionality that's not contained in the product. So what we also did in this project, we created uh, something like a UI editor. So it's possible to have the UI tree for uh, a screen and then you can uh, change uh, the order of the fields or also the property of the fields. So if it's visible or not, you could change the color, the behavior, uh, everything can be done uh, in this UI editor and this will be stored in the database. And so the flow is if the user opens such a module, uh, some application code will run that first of all uses uh, the database to get the UI data um, and then builds the UI. So sometimes we also have special requirements based on the user rights or on the data. So not every user might, might uh, see the same data. And once this process is done, the UI is ready and will be shown um, to the user. So the question was, what framework will we use for that purpose? Uh, in the beginning, 
my client tried to use uh, low code frameworks because Oracle Forms is also kind of a low code framework. Um, and they failed because it was hard to adapt uh, existing low code frameworks to these special requirements. And so we started to look around and found uh, Vadin because we, or we, the customers, developers are all Java developers. And so it was very um, important to find a framework that uh, Java developers can use easily. And that's why we went with Vadin and the project is quite successful. We are still working on the migration of the old system because there are many uh, forms to migrate, but finally everything uh, runs smoothly. And uh, also the, the idea of this runtime build UI framework works quite well. So based on that experience, I'd like to show you uh, two frameworks. First of all, I show you Vadin. Uh, Vadin is quite a popular framework. We will see that uh, in the timeline. And recently they introduced a new framework. It's called Hilla. By the way, Vadin is the name for Rentier in Finland and Hilla is the name for Cloudberry. And that's also why we have uh, these two logos that shows like a berry on the right hand side. And if you turn your head, you will maybe see the Rentier uh, in the blue logo uh, beside the Vadin text. So if you look at the history, you can see that uh, Vadin is already very old. So it's uh, 22 years old around. And uh, if people know Vadin, they mostly know the version that was introduced in 2009 when they used uh, GWT. So this Google Web Toolkit in these days was very popular. The idea of uh, Google Web Toolkit was to generate JavaScript code that runs in a browser based on a Java code base. But uh, after a few years, uh, Google Web Toolkit uh, was no longer supported by Google and they were looking for some new ID, how they can do that. And uh, they introduced uh, Vadin Flow in 2019. And that was exactly the year I was went into the project and we started to build uh, or to migrate um, the ERP system. And later on, they changed from uh, Polymer framework to lit. I will talk about web components in a minute. And uh, in 2021, they introduced Fusion and this was renamed to Hilla recently. And what they also added uh, most recently was the React support. So what are the reasons to use Vadin Flow or Hilla as a web application framework? First of all, both frameworks are an excellent fit for data-centric business applications. So like an ERP system or a back office application where you have a lot of data, you want to display in grids, for example, or in trees, you want to page, sort, filter, um, this uh, kind of stuff. And if you, for example, click on, on an, an item in the grid, you want to edit the data in the form, you need validation, you need data binding and conversion and so on. That's one thing that you need. The other thing that you also need is a component model. So you don't want to build your components from scratch or you want to use um, HTML to create the uh, components. So um, Vadin comes with uh, web components that are already pre-made and they are easily stylable for your needs because it's important that your application at the end looks like um, a design that you get from a UX designer or for example, you have a corporate design that you want to may, may want to use. So that's quite uh, the interesting thing about uh, the UI and the look and feel, but you also want to integrate the build for front end and back end because you usually are more like a back end developer who, who needs to build a front end for like a data centric business application. Now what are web components? Web components, uh, is a standard that uh, extends uh, standard HTML so you can create uh, reusable components that have consists of some custom elements that you can use. Then in the application, you have a shadow DOM, like a private section where you can um, implement the internals of your web components. And then you have a HTML template that is used to display this component. And the interesting thing is the quote from Alex Russell, from Twitter, he wrote that uh, if you're using Edge, Chrome, or Firefox, then you are using web components. So, for example, Firefox is made 
percent out of uh, web components. And Alex Russell, by the way, is uh, the product manager of Microsoft's Edge browser that is based, based on Chromium. Now, let's have a look at the architecture first. Uh, what in Flow? architecture uh, is a bit special compared to other web frameworks because either you have a single page application or you have like server-side rendering. But Vadinflow is different. And um, what we can see here is that we have uh, on the bottom the application server. So the application server means usually this is a Spring Boot application or a Quarkus application or whatever you want to use because it runs with every Serlet container, and there in uh, this uh, Serlet container, um, the Vadin application will have a backend user interface code. So you have the user interface code on the server. So you program in Java entirely, and this makes it very easy to access the backend because you're already on the server. You don't need to have a REST API or something like that. You can directly use uh, the services, so the business logic or uh, per and persistence if you need to. And then you use from the user interface code, code from Vadin. So for every web component that you may want to use, there is also a component in Java. We will see that in the minute how the code looks like. And you have HTML templates and themes to style and to lay out uh, your application. And exactly these three components you also will have on the browser side. So at development time, you think that writing what in application is uh, like uh, writing a UI application on the server side, but at runtime, you will get the single page application. So you will have web components, the templates, and the theme also on the browser. And the idea is that what in flow communicates with the server. So if someone enters some data in a text field, for example, this will send to the server. And then based on the um, on the event listening on the server, maybe the component uh, tree will be changed and this will be sent to the client again and the client will then re-render the website based on, on the changes. So it will do a minimal update and that's why I told you that it's uh, the same as you would do with a single page application, but you will not see it. That's internal in the Vadin framework. Now, as I already said, the point of one in flow is you have a Java UI component API, so you don't need any REST API. So this saves time because if you build a single page application with the client, with the REST API and with the backend, you get three parts that you have to maintain, you have to test, and here you only have the UI code and the backend code entirely in Java. So it makes it uh, also very easy uh, to test. On the other hand, you have a bidirectional data binding. That means the user interface changes. Uh, then this will send to the server. On the server, you change the state of the application, and this will apply it um, to your uh, application on the client side. So let's have a look at some example code first. Um, this is uh, hello view, and this is has just one annotation route and the route means this will produce an ex, um, a website that you can access by URL. In that case, route will uh, derive the URL from the class name. So hello view will become hello. So you will be able to access um, this page on the hello URL. And then in the constructor, you see that you do something like you would do if you would do a desktop application development. So you create a text field, you create a label, um, you create a button, and you can add a click listener. And then finally, you add text field, label, and button to, uh, in that case, a vertical layout. That's a component uh, to um, lay out um, your application, finally. Then on the other hand, before we dive into the demo, um, how is Hilla uh, different from Vadin? The common thing about Hilla and Vadin is that they both use the same web components. So if you're a Vadin developer, you also can use the same web components on Hilla. You will use another client technology, but it will look very familiar because you really use the same web components with the same event listeners, same properties and stuff. 
So that's quite easy. But the difference is that Tilla is a true single page application. So you have this application shell. Um, by the way, you can use either lit and I will show you examples with lit because as a Java developer, I find, find lit uh, easier to start with, or you can use react, uh, but it's a very popular single page application framework um, to create uh, the UI site. So you have an application shell, you have also routing with different views with URLs. But the point that Tilla helps you in building uh, single page applications is that you don't need a REST API or you don't create a traditional REST API, but you create on the server side our endpoints. And based on these endpoints, the client access code for your client application will be generated. Um, and then you can uh, access the backend in a type safe manner and you don't have to do anything. So you also don't have to uh, create uh, like a front end build. This is all integrated in the Hilla uh, Maven or Gradle build and you just have uh, to use that. So this comes in very handy because you don't have to care about two completely different build types. So the NPM build and the Maven build, you just use the Maven build and uh, the client build with will be hidden inside the main plugin in that case. So the idea of Hilla, by the way, it was formally uh, named as Wad Infusion and they decided to, uh, to rename it to have a best, better distinction between Hilla and Wadin. And uh, the idea is that you create in currently only a Spring application or a Spring Boot application that you add a reactive TypeScript frontend to. You can use lit react, as I already told you, and you use the same web components that you also use when using Vadin. And the important thing here is that you have no REST API. So we will see that in a minute in the demo, how this looks like. But that's also important to say, and I didn't mention it before when I introduced Vadin, um, based on the single page application architecture of Hilla, you have no server state. So the endpoints here on the Java backend are all stateless. In contrast to this architecture here with Wadin Flow, uh, where we have server state. So that means you have the component tree on the server and on the client, and they will be synchronized. And having server state, depending on the runtime model or the, the, how you operate your application may be um, kind of an issue. And so that's also why there are two different um, frameworks. So in our case, uh, with the ERP system, we use Wadin as the UI framework for the ERP system, because an ERP system, as you have seen, has a lot of data tables, for example, and a lot of uh, functionality, but usually it doesn't have a lot of uses. So you don't have to scale horizontally, usually in ERP system. So it doesn't really matter if you have state or not. By the way, there are also solutions to synchronize the state on the server if you have like Kubernetes or something like that uh, as a runtime. But we decided to implement a new uh, web shop based on the ERP system. And this one was uh, built with Hilla because we wanted to avoid uh, this server state. So, uh, just a few words about lit because React you already may know, uh, but lit is maybe not so uh, well known. Lit is a library for building these web components. Before we had Polymer, you may have heard Polymer already. Polymer is uh, in maintenance mode now and is no longer um, supported. So you should use lit as a replacement for uh, Polymer and it's quite easy to, to get started with it. So how does it look like? Because we are, we are creating web components, we have to have a, a decorator custom element in that case that has a name and does, did, this will be the name of the web component. We will see that uh, in the demo as well. And uh, this extends here from view. View is a class from uh, Vadin, but uh, finally, you extends uh, lit element as a base class for the web component. And then you have a render method where you have the HTML template. 
So here we also use web components. By the way, you can see that it's a web component because it has a dash in the name. So that's name convention to add dashes uh, to distinguish it from regular HTML tags. And here we have a label and uh, with yet we see an action listener. And uh, so if the name is changed, we store the name in an internal attribute here of this hello world view class. And uh, then the button has a click listener and the click listener shows a notification uh, with the name that uh, we uh, just stored in this name element. And on the backend side, we don't have a REST controller. If we would have, if we would use Spring Boot, we have an endpoint. And the difference is that we don't have a RESTful style of an API. We have more like a remote procedure call um, API. So that means we have um, a method permitted to all method, to all methods, for example, or a permitted to role method here in that case. And what's important to, to mention is that all the endpoints are secure by default. So we have to add security annotations to tell Hilla what, who can access uh, the methods. For example, this one is annotated with permit all. That means uh, everybody that is uh, logged in can use the method or we can specify it, for example, rows allowed and to def and define one or more um, roles that can access uh, the endpoint. So uh, which one should you use? In my opinion, uh, Vadinflow is uh, very well uh, uh, suited for data centering applications. So if you do backend applications or if you do a lot of small applications um, as a backend system, that's a very good fit. And if you want to do full stack development only with Java. So you don't need uh, JavaScript know-how you need some uh, CSS know-how, maybe if you want to uh, change the, the style uh, of the application, but not everybody in the team has to have know-how about CSS. So it's okay to have just one CSS uh, developer that can help you with the styling of the application. If you have a lot of applications, you can create one theme for your company and then reuse that in every project. On the other hand, Hilla, uh, you can use if you want to avoid service state or if you have a lot of client interaction. So if you want to use the um, browser capabilities, um, for example, to build a offline capable application, then you should go with Hilla. And maybe you already have some front end developers that know TypeScript and you want to integrate that in your team. So it's very good fit also for Hilla. So also because uh, they added recently the React support if you have React developers, uh, they will just be familiar with the way how to work with the front end. So now let's have a look at, uh, at some application. Um, here we have uh, Hello World. Uh, there are two versions, uh, Vadin Hello World and the Hilla Hello World. And you see they look the same. They look the same because they use the same web components. Um, and they also look the same because they use the default Vadin Lumosin. That is, as I said, adaptable. Um, the easiest way to adapt that is to use some CSS3 variables that you can set and change. For example, the color or the, the font or uh, the sizes of the various elements. So that's probably uh, easy to, to use. I will zoom in to a bit. And uh, here, for example, you can uh, enter a name and say hello. And we see uh, on the left, uh, lower corner that it says hello dev days. Now, how that, does this work? Let's check out um, the development console. And first of all, uh, let's have a look at this element here, for example, and make it a little bit bigger that you can see it. And here we see uh, a div outlet because also Vadin is a single page application at runtime, it has this shell, but then it contains web components. So we have a Vadin web application layout, for example, then we have a horizontal layout here, but then we have here the web, uh, the text field and the button. These are both web components with some uh, additional uh, information. Here we have uh, the so-called light DOM. So that's the internal 
uh, part used to display the component and then we have the shadow root that would be the private part that you cannot access from the outside. Recently, Vadin moved a lot of uh, internal stuff of the web components to the light DOM because of accessibility. So if you have uh, users that have some uh, problems, for example, with their eyes and they can't see uh, the screen very well, um, Vadin com web components also support uh, uh, tools like screen readers and stuff like that uh, very well now. There's even a matrix that shows which parts of uh, accessibility capable features are supported by Vadin. So now the, the interesting thing is what happens if we uh, do hear something. For example, what will happen if I hit the button? If I click on the button, there will be uh, a few requests and it's always a bit complicated to find the right one. Um, but here we see that with the changes, so the payload that we sent is, we had a click on the button. That's uh, this one here in the payload. And the response that we get uh, is the notification below. We can't see that uh, really well because it's hidden in inside uh, this um, JSON response. But the idea is that uh, if you click on an element, you will get uh, the response with uh, what should be changed on the UI. So presenting uh, the notification on the lower left corner is just an update of the DOM element, like you will see if you uh, do a single page application framework. So there will be no server side rendering requests, only the first time you access the application, you get uh, the shell. Now let's switch to the Hill application. And here we do the same. And if I click here and say hello, uh, it something different happens. So first of all, I just get the message as the response. And in the payload, I sent the name. And if you have a look at uh, the request, is we see that this is uh, a request to a endpoint, hello world endpoint in that case with the method say hello. And that's what I was mentioning before. With uh, Hilia, you don't get the RESTful API, you get the RPC style API. Mm -hmm. So that means you can it, you could reuse this API, but often it doesn't make sense to reuse an API that is built for a UI because it just serves the purpose of the UI. So it's kind of a backend for front-end um, implementation and you will not be able to use that as a third party um, REST API, for example. But in my opinion, this rarely makes any sense anyway. So now we've, you've seen the application running. So let's have a look at how the application uh, looks like in the code. The most important thing is that we see when we start with the Hill application that we also have package JSON file. So like a regular application or a single page application, we have here package JSON, but we don't need to touch that. We could touch that when we want to add some components that are not uh, provided by, by Vadin, for example, but usually you don't touch that. But what's uh, important to see is that here it's a regular uh, Spring Boot application, by the way, Spring Boot 3 in that case, and it brings in the Hilla bomb as a dependency management, and we use the, the Hilla framework here. And based on the code on the back end, uh, we will uh, have generated some endpoints. For example, the Hello World endpoint that we had a look at it before. But the application has another part, and this is uh, quite more interesting. It has a master detail. So here we have a grid, and we can uh, select um, the persons on uh, that grid, and it will be displayed here. And we can, can change that and save it, and it will be updated here right away. So this is also the same 
on both applications. So you can compare then. I will tell you where you will find the source code of the demo. And uh, this works in both applications the same way. It's there that you can compare uh, both frameworks. So let's have a look at the data endpoint. And here we see that we have a person endpoint. Um, there is also an annotation called anonymous allowed. And this anonymous allowed uh, annotation indicates that it's not protected. So usually endpoints are protected. So you can't access that without login. But here we don't have a login. So I added this anonymous allowed annotation to um, make it publicly available. Um, something that I wanted to show you here in that endpoint are these non null annotations. These non null annotations are used to generate uh, the TypeScript code because in TypeScript, if you don't specify anything, all the attributes will be mandatory. So they are not nullable. But if you have um, things that should be nullable, then this has to be uh, indicated by uh, the question mark. But in Java, it's different. Java, per se, all types are nullable. Expect the primitive ones, but all the classes are nullable. And so you have to add some information that uh, will better fit for um, the uh, TypeScript code on that case. So we have like list and get and save. And now let's have a look where this is generated. We have a generated uh, folder. And here we have a person endpoint. And this person endpoint contains the same methods. So they are uh, numbered because of maybe you will overload it on the server. But we have count, delete, get, list, all the same um, methods. And we even have the person. So the hello world, or not the hello world endpoint. Uh, sorry, the person endpoint returns a person. The person uh, is, an, in that case, an entity. Probably you wouldn't do that in, in real world. But here for my demo, it's uh, quite easier to directly use um, the entity. And here we also see the non-null annotations that are used, first of all, for the TypeScript generated. But we also have email annotation. And this email annotation is a, um, a bean validation annotation and this can also be used on the client side for validation. But let's get back to the generated code. So here we have, uh, for example, list at list returns a, an array of persons. And here we, with the person we see what I told you just before, the date of birth probably didn't have any non-null annotation that it's why it's optional, but email first name and so on are all mandatory attributes. That's because of this non-null um, annotation that we used before. And so we can use that in the view. So let's have a look at the more complicated view. We'll have this master detail view. And uh, this master detail view has uh, a grid, a running grid. Here we have a data provider. A data provider is used for lazy fetching the data. Um, so this data provider here, um, let's see where we'd have it. Um, I don't select it. Uh, connect callback. Sorry, here we have the data provider generation. And we see uh, we create uh, a sort, for example, based on the sort that we get from the grid. And then we have the person list, a person endpoint list method. And here we pass the page and the page size and the sort information. So we can use paging uh, from the client uh, to the server. That's all built in uh, for uh, Hilla. So that's quite handy to use. And on the other hand, what I want to show you is the binder. So a binder is used to bind um, data to UI elements. And the binder also has a type. So it has a type person. That's our uh, object that we transfer. But uh, what Hilla also generates is a person model. And this person model is uh, used for the binder to see if it's a string, for example, or a Boolean. If it's uh, optional, like the date of birth, or if it's uh, mandatory, like the email address. And here we have also this new email underscore one means that's used then later on for uh, the validation. So it generated from the email annotation on the backend person uh, Java class, it generated this uh, email here to validate uh, the email address in the UI. So that's how it looks on uh, the Hilla side. We also have routes. Um, so we have view routes for Hello World 
and uh, also for master detail, that's not different from other single page application frameworks. Now move to the Vadin side. If we will be familiar with the application also there, here we have also this master detail view. And this master detail view here is uh, just a Java class. So we have a grid also on the server side. That means the grid that we've seen before in the Hilla lit ele element um, template is the same web component as we have here on the server. So this is uh, also typed. We have a person here and then we have some text fields to enter the data. We have some buttons. We have also a validator here in that case, a bean validation uh, validator because this bean validation validator will use bean validation to validate. So that's probably why it has the same name. And then we go and add some columns. Um, there are various ways to add columns here. In that case, it's uh, used with the property name. In my opinion, that's just because this uh, demo, for the demo, I wouldn't use that. I would provide a static reference to the first name getter, for example. You can also add component columns. So if you want to have uh, like rich uh, components inside com in columns of a grid, you can do that for sure. And what we also can do is we can directly use the lit renderer uh, to render a Vatin icon here in that case into uh, the grid, but that's probably just also for the demo. Usually you would add uh, directly a Vatin icon with the component column. That's much easier for Java developers. So here we have kind of mix, but I wanted to show you that this is also possible. And then the interesting uh, part comes here. So uh, the grid has uh, set items and set items has is overloaded method. So it, you can pass a list of elements to the grid. So if you have a, a small grid where you want to show just a handful of elements, you can probably use set items. And uh, on the other hand, if you want to uh, have paging like I want to have here, you uh, have a Lambda and in this Lambda you get the query queries of type uh, Vadin query. And the Vadin query, we can uh, just have a look at uh, this query here. So we have a, this fetch callback and the fetch callback provides this query. And in the query we see we have offset limit, we have sort orders, we have filter information. So everything that you can do with the grid and the user can do, for example, he can scroll down, then it will be lazy fetched. Or it, if he clicks on the headers, then um, the grid will be sorted, will pass to this Lambda with the query, and then you can create a page request. So the page request is a, an element from Spring uh, Data, and there you can pass the page and the page size, and there's a what in Spring Data help class that allows you to uh, convert from the query sort order to a sort for uh, Spring Data. And then you just return a stream, and the elements uh, will get populated. Then we also have the possibility to have a, a value change or a selection listener. And then uh, with this selection, for example, uh, we will load uh, the data. And uh, let me check where we are exactly here. So it will uh, do um, uh, a redirect because we want to keep the URL also for editing the data can show you that uh, here in the detail. If you look at the URL here, you see master detail slash eight and edit. So eight means we are on uh, probably on, on the person with the ID eight. So this can be bookmarked. That's the reason why we do that. And then with this person ID, we get uh, the person from the back end. And if it's there, uh, populating the form means we pass the person to the binder with read bean, and then it will uh, bind uh, the attributes of uh, the class to um, the form. And if you want to save it, like we have a save button here, then the person uh, will be uh, populated with the change data with write bean, and then we can call uh, update on the person service with what will uh, result in a uh, update statement probably um, on the other side.
so that's it from the demo. Um, let's go back uh, to the conclusion. Uh, in my opinion, Wadin Flow works very well if you want to create uh, the UI uh, entirely in Java. So if you're Java developers, you want to build ERP systems, for example, backend systems, small applications that are very data centric, then Wadin Flow is probably um, the better fit. Uh, but with both frameworks, Wadin and Hilla, uh, you don't have to care about client-server communication. That's all type safe and done by the framework. And you really can concentrate on building the application. You don't have to care about the build system, for example. You just uh, write the code. And finally, um, I wasn't talking about that, but you will get a single deployment. In our case, you get an executable jar, for example, that you can use in a Docker container uh, to run your application. So you get a single deployment, and that's very convenient. Uh, in in many cases. The source code you will find on github.com, cmas, ch, slash, vadin, and hila. And if you like to get in touch with me, I have a website with a blog and some videos, martinelli.ch. Uh, you can find my contact information there. Are there any questions? Awesome, uh, Simon. That's a wonderful talk. Do you think you could maybe post those links uh, in the chat on Pine uh, as well so that people can check it out afterwards? Uh, or I don't know, maybe you want to share your slides uh, um, afterwards on Twitter or wherever you are on the internet and then people can check those out as well. Um, we do have a question and I have some questions myself, but we'll start with an audience questions because I'm nice like that. Um, so the question is, how limiting is the Vadin or Hilla Pro uh, license in your project? Did you need uh, a license or is it possible to do anything by creating custom components on the open source version? Yeah, the point is um, the Pro version comes with some features. For example, you have a test bench that's uh, based on Selenium um, to do end-to-end -end tests. That's quite convenient. And one of the pro components that we uh, indeed use in our project uh, are, is the charts component. Uh, because uh, charting from the Java side is quite complicated, so it's useful to have a license. But other from that too, uh, you don't need uh, um, a pro version. Uh, I have a lot of projects where we are just fine with the open source version. And um, so you can opt in if you really need some of the pro functionality later on in the project. So this shouldn't stop you from uh, starting with the open source version, because in most cases, you're probably fine with just that. Awesome. Thank you. And let's stay on the topic of open source. Uh, did you ever uh, contribute yourself to Vadin or uh, Hilla? Yes, I do some contribution uh, lately. And I also added a framework or a framework like a framework integration. I use Truk, Java Object Oriented Querying. It's like a SQL uh, from Java. It's, mm. a, it's a library for persistence. And I integrated that with Vadin directly. So there is a Vadin uh, third party directory where a lot of people contribute their components or their integration with other frameworks for, uh, for Vadin. And this is very easy to do. So everybody can contribute to Vadin. And oh, Vadin is on GitHub. You can find all the source code there. That's yeah, the I, uh, I link to the GitHub uh, or to the to the websites uh, in the chat too as well. So if anyone else has uh, wishes for Vadin or Hilat, they can just contribute, right? Yeah. Um, so I had a question about what's missing from these projects in your opinion, but I'm guessing that's what you're implementing. If there's anything missing, you can just implement it, right? Yeah, the point is if you have if you have something that you really need, like special components, there are various ways to achieve that. First of all, usually we create like composite components. So we add existing components and create a new one out of it. Hmm. Uh, the other point is that there are thousands of web components because web components are popular in a way, but a lot of people don't know about that. So there is webcomponents.org and there is also a directory and there is, uh, like a guide how you can integrate uh, third-party web components directly in, in Vadin, because what you have, will have to do, you have to add the web components to your project, and then you have to write a Java class that encapsulates the functionality of the web component that you can use then on the Java server side. 
And finally, if all of that doesn't work, you can get in touch with Vadin and they will help you to build such uh, web components if you like to. There is also a Discord uh, server for Vadin where you can find other people that may have already done that and you can get in touch with all these people from the community. So that's excellent tips, right? Because all of the communities organize differently. So if you have that knowledge, that's good to, to have. So anyone who's listening, that's like, oh, I, you know, like this sounds interesting, but I also wanted to do this. Uh, these are the avenues that you can walk. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Simon. I hope we can still see you in the Pine platform afterwards, uh, checking out some of the other talks and maybe you have questions for them. Um, I want to thank you so much and have a wonderful day, everyone. See you yeah, at the next Thank talk. you very much for having me. Bye bye. bye. This is all we got. Dreaming about a revolution in our minds. This is all we got. Lock me out of this life institution. I am angry and I am illusions. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, buddy. I'm just a human. Oh, we don't need to say we're sorry. We don't need to say we're sorry.